I'm Caroline Uhler, a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and the Institute for Data, Systems and Society at MIT, and also a core faculty member at the Broad Institute, one of the world's leading biomedical research centers. At the Broad, I direct the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center, which seeks to create a two-way street between machine learning and biology. And hi, I'm Or Aschenberg, Associate Director of Computational Biology at the Klarman Cell Observatory in the Broad Institute. The Klarman Cell Observatory is led by Dr. Ron Xavier, and for over a decade, we have led pioneering efforts to understand how cells work together to create healthy tissues and how that process unravels during diseases like autoimmunity and cancer. And today, we want to share with you an exciting challenge taking place this October. So the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center and the Klarman Cell Observatory are holding the Autoimmune Disease Machine Learning Challenge. We're collaborating also with Crunch and Foundry, as well as Harvard's Laboratory for Innovation Science, MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and the Institute for Data Systems and Society, and the Mass General Hospital Center for the study of inflammatory bowel disease. Today, we're here to talk about why we're doing this challenge and also to discuss the problems at hand. We'll talk about autoimmune diseases, where our immune system mistakenly attacks our own healthy tissues, exciting new biological data sets that could open novel avenues for treating patients with these diseases, and why we think machine learning is the key to unlocking the power of these data. We'll also get into the challenge itself. Can you design algorithms that identify genes driving an autoimmune disease and increasing our risk of developing cancer? Now, for some of our viewers, it may have been a while since biology class in high school or college. So, or let's talk about our immune system and autoimmune diseases. So, normally when we get sick, say with a virus, our immune system mounts a response. Immune cells travel through our body to the site of infection, recognize cells infected by the virus, and destroy those cells. This response protects us against viruses, bacteria, and even cancer. Right, our immune system has a remarkable mix of capabilities, both a built-in ability to recognize features shared across thousands of different pathogens, and a learned ability to recognize pathogens it has never seen before, which is what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, this power comes at a cost. The immune system can mistake our own healthy cells and tissues for a pathogen and attack and kill them. This is the basis of autoimmune disease. Yeah. And many of us have family and friends with autoimmune diseases, such as diabetes or multiple sclerosis. One of the most common autoimmune diseases is inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD. IBD is caused when the barrier between our gut and the microbes living there breaks down. And as this barrier falls apart, our immune system attacks both our gut and the resident microbes there, resulting in chronic inflammation. IBD symptoms are painful and affect quality of life, and treatments range from steroids all the way to surgery to remove the diseased gut tissue. To make things worse, IBD also increases the risk of colorectal cancer. Over the past 50 years, we've made great progress in treating IBD patients, but we're really not there yet. We still don't fully understand the steps behind the progression of IBD. And without this, we cannot develop new therapies or detect and treat colorectal cancer earlier. So how can we reach these critical goals? So first, let's talk with a pathologist about how IBD is diagnosed. I'm Dr. Angela Shi, an assistant in pathology at Mass General Hospital and an assistant professor in pathology at Harvard Medical School. As a pathologist who specializes in gastrointestinal illnesses, my role is to accurately diagnose whether a patient has IBD, how severe their disease may be, and whether or not they have developed secondary complications. This information guides the therapeutic approaches doctors choose to manage their patient's disease. And so how do you make the correct diagnosis? It all starts with examining very small pieces of tissue or biopsies that are taken throughout the gastrointestinal tract from a patient during an endoscopy procedure. This tissue undergoes processing in the laboratory that allows us to cut a very thin five micron tissue section that is stained with two routine chemicals, hematoxylin, which stains nuclear material blue, and eosin, which stains the cell's cytoplasm pink. This processing allows us to visually evaluate the composition and architecture of the cells that are making up the gut. Here we are looking at a hematoxylin and eosin stained image, or H&E image for short, of the healthy adult colon. 
The staining reveals four distinct layers of the gut, each with a specific function. The inner layer is the mucosa, which is the layer that comes into contact with digested food passing through our gut and is very important for absorbing nutrients and water. This layer is supported by a subjacent submucosa. Third is a thick, smooth muscle layer called the muscularis propria, which helps with peristalsis and pushing food through the gut. Lastly, there is the outer adventitial layer with a serosal surface. Right, but how does each layer work? Well, each layer is highly organized and does a lot. For example, the mucosa is divided into the epithelial compartment, the lamina propria compartment, which contains inflammatory cells, and the muscularis mucosae beneath it. The epithelium forms beautiful crypt structures that have stem cells at their base, all of which continually differentiate into cells that absorb nutrients or cells that secrete important signals. Now, as a pathologist, I have looked at thousands of these H&E images during my training and clinical practice, and so my eyes are quickly drawn to the pathologic features in these tissues. Here we are looking at a colon tissue from a patient with ulcerative colitis, the most common form of IBD, and what you will work on in this challenge. You can immediately see how much the gut tissue changes during ulcerative colitis. We see dramatic differences in the tissue layers, their anatomical structures, and the individual cells. When I diagnose ulcerative colitis, I look for several features. For example, here I see distortions in the crypt morphology, and here I see an infiltration of immune cells, including neutrophils. Remember, inflammatory bowel disease is an autoimmune disease, so the arrival of these immune cells makes a lot of sense. I don't just use these images of the gut to diagnose IVD. I also use them to look for warning signs of cancer, as the risk for colorectal cancer can be up to twofold higher in IVD patients. Here we see low-grade dysplasia, which are abnormal epithelial cells in the gut that may develop into cancer. Depending on the severity of the dysplasia, we may try to remove the tissue through an endoscopy procedure or even remove larger portions of the colon to prevent cancer. Improved understanding of dysplasia could lead to earlier detection and more informed patient management decisions. So routine H&E images have been analyzed by pathologists for hundreds of years, but I think it's important to recognize that there are limitations to what we do. So for example, all we can really tell you is the activity of a disease at a certain point in time. What we cannot inform clinicians and patients is how they might respond to specific treatments or how they might actually go on to develop secondary complications. I think that this is a new future horizon for pathology in integrating what we see on histologic findings with additional molecular biology and computational methods to really have an impact on the treatment of patient diseases. So to summarize Dr. Shi's work, pathologists guide the care of IBD patients by analyzing tissue from the inflamed gut. They stain this tissue with special dyes which reveal the spatial organization and anatomical features of cells in the gut. During IBD, these change dramatically in telltale patterns, allowing a diagnosis to be made. Such H&E images of the gut are routinely collected in hospitals around the world, resulting in a data set of potentially millions of images. While such images have guided patient care for decades, we are ultimately using known patterns in the tissue to label the diseases in these images. Right, but how can we identify more powerful markers of early cancer so that we can detect cancer earlier than pathologists can currently do? Or how can we better understand who will respond to which therapy, or even ultimately develop new therapies? For this, we need to be able to translate from the morphology of a cell, which we can observe in an H&E image, to the internal functional state of a cell given by the activity of our genes. So we each have 20,000 genes in each of our cells, and distinct groups of these genes are activated together to carry out the programs within a cell. Now, during disease, hundreds of these genes change their activity and drive dysfunctional changes in the tissue. Therefore, identifying the altered gene programs can highlight new targets for therapeutic intervention and allow us to pinpoint earlier any transition to cancer. So given how important they are, how can we measure these gene programs? Unfortunately, this is not a measurement typically made by pathologists. And even when they do, they measure at most two or three genes. But ideally, we'd like to measure thousands. And this is really where large-scale data sets and machine learning come in. 
The life sciences are in the midst of a data revolution where it is now possible to accurately and in very inexpensive ways do large-scale DNA sequencing, where we have advanced molecular imaging and single cell technologies allow measuring the activity of all 20,000 genes simultaneously in single cells for 1 million cells per experiment. In addition, over the last 10 years, there has been a really exciting development. New technologies, many of which have been developed here at the Broad, have made spatial genomics a reality. Right. So while single cell technologies require isolating single cells from the tissue context, spatial genomics technologies allow us to measure the activity of genes directly within the tissue context, giving rise to a very high content and high resolution view of a tissue. These innovations and the massive data sets they produce have really brought us to a new era in biomedicine. Our ability to generate data is rapidly outpacing our ability to analyze and interpret it. To give you a better idea, a single lab can generate a data set that rivals in size the entire movie library of Netflix. Here at the Broad, just the genomics platform alone generated 100 petabytes of data last year, which is 100 million gigabytes. Put simply, we have reached the limits of unaided human comprehension. But fortunately, the last two decades have witnessed not only a transformation of the life sciences, but also the data sciences. As we all know, we're living in the golden age of AI and machine learning. But unlike in the more traditional applications of machine learning and AI, like recommender systems or online advertising, in the biomedical sciences, the ultimate goal is often to understand the underlying mechanisms. For example, in our autoimmune disease machine learning challenge, we want to comprehensively identify gene programs in IBD by connecting tissue images collected by pathologists to this high-resolution view of genes active in the tissue afforded by spatial genomics. And we want to identify genes that mark potential cancerous regions in the gut. So the mechanistic aspect is really important for this application. The tissue images processed by pathologists are cheap to collect and number in the millions worldwide. In contrast, spatial genomics data sets where we measure genes directly in the tissue are difficult to collect, very expensive, and number less than 100 for IBD. Linking these different data modalities would give us the best of both worlds. The intricate spatial organization of the gut tissue provided by pathology with the detailed gene programs provided by genomics. But how can we translate between these two modalities? This is exactly where you and your algorithms come into our machine learning challenge to identify gene programs from IBD tissue images and discover genes that mark the progression of IBD to cancer. To make this happen, we've collected eight spatial genomics datasets from the gut tissue of patients with and without IBD. And we measured the activity of 480 genes across hundreds of thousands of cells in these tissues. From these very same tissue regions, Dr. Shi performed pathology analysis and prepared H&E images. So that means for these eight tissue regions, we can see how the two color H&E image translates to the 480 color image that measures the activity of 480 genes. But of course, you remember we said that each of our cells has 20,000 genes. So what about the missing 19,500 genes that we never measured? Unfortunately, current spatial genomics technologies still aren't able to measure the activity of all our genes at single cell resolution together with h &E images in the same tissue region. But we will provide you with single cell data collected from IBD patients, where we measure the activity of all 20,000 genes, but at the cost of losing the location of the individual cells in the tissue. Now, given these training data, the challenge is to design the algorithms that can predict the activity of all 20,000 genes given the tissue images from pathologists. Or, in other words, translate from a two-color H&E image taken from an IBD patient to a 20,000-color image of that same tissue region, which predicts the activity of each gene in each cell in the tissue region. This will allow us to identify distinct groups of genes that are altered in IBD, as well as in the transition to cancer. 
Most importantly, this will provide new candidate gene markers for the early detection of dysplasia and thus early cancer detection, as well as new potential targets for therapeutic interventions. So here is the exact breakdown of the challenge. In part one, you will predict the activity of genes from pathologist tissue images, and we will evaluate you on the held out sets of tissue regions and genes. To help you develop your algorithms, we will provide you with your algorithm's performance on a validation set of tissue regions. In part two, you will propose new genes that based on your algorithms would boost our ability to distinguish gut tissue regions with dysplasia from those without. Finally, in part three, you will come up with a new metric for ranking how well a set of genes identifies dysplasia. And we're really excited to announce something unique to this challenge, which is that the top scores from part one will have the genes they identify as marking dysplasia experimentally validated in the lab. So you can get to see how well your algorithms actually perform in identifying regions of IBD tissue that could develop into cancer. Now note that a biology background isn't needed to participate. The Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center will provide all challenge participants with a short online crash course. The Broad Institute is a global leader in biomedical research, particularly in genetic sequencing. So this is really a unique opportunity to learn from leading life science and computational biology experts. The crash course will take you through the biology of our immune systems and IBD, and how pathologists diagnose IBD in patients. You'll also learn more about the technology that we use to generate the spatial and single cell genomics data sets from the gut that you'll be working with. The crash course will give you an introduction to the biases of these types of data and how to work with the data. You'll be well prepared for the challenge at hand. Now the challenge will run from October 2024 to January 2025. You can sign up as individual or a team and we'll be giving out monetary prizes to the winners of each part of the challenge, totaling 50,000 US dollars. The top algorithms will be presented in the resulting publications. Now, another great product of this challenge is that the resulting data, algorithms, and code from the challenge will be made open source for the community to use. We will also be adding to these spatial data sets as new experiments and data become available, and we would love for you to remain engaged in this problem even after the completion of this particular challenge. To achieve the goals of this challenge, we're going to need new ideas. New ideas that break through the bounds of the traditional approaches that address the most pressing questions and ultimately help us intersect machine learning with biology. So not only will you get to do something you love, but your algorithms could change the course of how we diagnose and treat IBD. If you haven't already, register now. We're very excited to be working with you.